All right. Uh, once again, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening and good morning, depending on which time zone you fall under. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all for our webinar we have today. This webinar is brought to you by IGEL and Citrix Ready as part of the Citrix Ready technical webinar series. IGEL has been our techni technology partner for more than a decade now and uh, recently been awarded also the partner of the month. Uh, so we, here we have the legal webinar. For this webinar, we have assembled a different set of people. We have a joint customer, uh, that's Brian Clark. He is the director of uh, information services at the legal firm, Schneider, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis LLP. And we will get to hear more fascinating stories about their application and desktop virtualization experiences. And we have John Anthony Smith. Uh, he is the chief listening officer at the Conversion Group. Uh, well, we sure will hear from him, especially around how successfully implemented uh, virtual workstations uh, at this uh, deployment site. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so housekeeping items. Uh, everything, everyone's on mute. So if you have issues, uh, please use the chat box available on your right side of the panel. If you can't hear us, uh, please turn up your volume. Uh, sometimes there can be activity issues. So if you are still facing, I recommend you disconnect and reconnect. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and uh, will be posted later in a day or two to your registered email ID. So in case uh, you miss a part of our conversation, uh, you can always get back to it. Uh, please post your questions to the question box uh, available on your right hand side. Um, next slide please. So the agenda um, that's uh, the agenda for you today. We will kick off with the Citrix Ready program uh, with a round of introductions of uh, who we are here, and then we go head on to a roundtable uh, discussion with moderated question, and then open it up for the audience. And before that, of course, we will have uh, our customer discuss um, their deployment and just get into more depths. So do not the opportunity to ask us questions and uh, learn from their experiences. Next slide, please. So uh, Citrix Ready program, uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, Citrix Ready is an end-to-end -end technology partner program. We will, we help you make better purchase decisions when looking out for third-party products that work with Citrix. Uh, we showcase compatible products on a catalog that's called the Citrix Ready Marketplace. Uh, uh, you can browse it to citrix.com slash ready. And uh, if you are such a, uh, uh, if you are a technology partner and having an integration touch point with Citrix products uh, and willing to join us, you can reach out to the partner page and sign up at the link uh, underneath. So, uh, next slide, please. All right, introduction. Uh, so I I am Sagnik Datta and I work for the Citrix, uh, leading the technical marketing activities in Citrix Ready. I'll be the moderate for today's webinar. I um, I have also Simon Cliffen, who is a VP of business development at IGEL, uh, and uh, and a recent feather on his cap was he was being listed as the top mid-market IT executive during the 2017 Mid-Size Enterprise Summit. And he manages the IGEL partnership with Citrix, and I'm glad to him on the call. So, Simon, uh, what do you want to introduce? Brian and Clark, John. Thank you very much, Sagnik. Just a couple of words on IGEL and our partnership with Citrix. Obviously, and w when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I think about is Citrix Ready and how we can be a better partner and how we can work together. Um, there's a very good fit between IGEL and Citrix Ready. IGEL is, you know, maniacally focused is my uh, is my uh, tagline on the endpoint and the end user experience. And you'll hear a little bit more about this as Brian describes his implementation. But we wake up thinking about how we can be a more effective partner with Citrix with the endpoint and optimizing the endpoint and endpoint user productivity. Citrix is an awesome solution for delivering applications and virtual desktops. And you'll hear a lot more about that in this use case. 
and then we focus on making sure that you have a superb experience at the uh, endpoint, which is very effective and very uh, relevant for the legal community because you have what we classify as prima donna users and we've got a very good solution in that space. Um, my role at iGel, I've been here for nine months now, I came after seven and a half years at AppSense, another big partner of Citrix, um, is to make sure that we have the right alliance partners, the right business partners, and we offer a complete solution. To do that, we deliver everything through the channel, and I'm also delighted that we're joined here by John Anthony Smith from Conversant Group, one of our uh, implementation specialists and the people who actually uh, make the stuff work. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to John. Maybe you can say a couple of words about your role, John, and what Conversant does. John, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So obviously, I'm John Anthony Smith. I'm the Chief Listening Officer of Conversant Group. I'm actually the company's founder as well. Um, we, we actually are an infrastructure and security consultancy based in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, we focus actually on information delivery, user experience, and security almost exclusively for law firms. And because our background uh, has been almost completely centered around law, we are incredibly focused on the user experience, uh, as Simon noted, which is why we are um, partnered with iGel, um, which obviously we're going to be sharing a story with you today about one of our successes, but we are very proud of our partnership with iGel and Citrix, uh, and we, we believe that their solutions are, are very um, applicable uh, to the legal industry. Um, and so we, we consider ourselves experts uh, in virtual desktop infrastructure and all the necessary components uh, to, del to deliver a proper user experience. So that's me. Brian, over to you. All right. So, uh, Brian Clark, I'm the director of IT for a law firm, uh, Schneider Harrison Cleveland Lewis LLP. Uh, the firm has been around since 1935. I've been there since 1998, which uh, is an eternity in uh, the IT world. I started as an intern when I was going to college at uh, Drexel in Philadelphia and uh, worked my way up through doing user support and network administration until eventually becoming director of IT two years ago. Uh, so we have, uh, we're based in Philadelphia, which is where our data center is. Uh, we have eight offices uh, throughout the continental U.S. Presently about 275 users, 140 of whom are attorneys, and uh, we're presently running about 240 iGel thin clients. So a little bit about the Schneider network. Uh, we have about 120 servers, which uh, is a lot for the amount of people we have, but with the amount of specialized applications and, and redundancy and multiple servers for single applications, it, it does add up. Uh, so we're fortunate that that is 99% uh, virtualized. Uh, we have eight offices all connecting back to our Philadelphia data center uh, over uh, a, an S, using an SD-WAN uh, to help leverage that. Uh, Going back to the 120 servers, we have over 100 applications that we specialize. We have uh, some departments such as uh, tax and wealth management, which use a lot of specialized applications uh, for uh, their practice of law. Uh, in terms of our hardware, uh, we use Cisco UCS uh, to support both our, our server and our uh, virtual desktop environment, along with Nimble Storage uh, running on a uh, running through VMware. Uh, our current desktop image is Windows 7 and Office 2010 as a base, and we also use iManage as our document management system. So we know uh, John Anthony and Conversant uh, through our use of them as our uh, primary uh, value-added reseller uh, for both uh, storage and Citrix, and they have added a lot of value for us. So let me tell you a little bit about the VDI rollout that we had at Schneider. Uh, it uh, started back in 2013. It, it was led by our, our previous director, and at the time I was working in the network operations group. So the initial problem was that we had aging Windows XP desktops. Uh, the hardware was from 2008, and of course XP was from 2001, and uh, Microsoft had set their end of life uh, for XP as well as Server 2003 for 
I believe it was July 2014, that was the, the last patch date. So uh, there was uh, a great need to upgrade from XP. And the question was, uh, at the time, do we just order new physical hardware or do we go with the latest uh, trend that was just starting to pick up at about that time, which was virtual desktops? So the decision was made uh, to go to VDI and um, to not buy uh, all new desktops, but uh, you know, to, to use the VDI solution. Now, there were a lot of complications that uh, weren't contemplated fully and flushed out fully uh, before going in the VDI direction. Uh, there's a list of some of them there. Uh, storage was the chief one. Uh, we had had a uh, a fairly new NetApp system, but a NetApp system that didn't have any uh, flash capability. So there were, you know, 15K spinning disks, but uh, that alone was not enough to support VDI. The, the thought at the time was, well, it's a, it's a new storage system. We just put it in last year. It should be fine, and uh, it wasn't fine. Uh, there were also wiring issues. We had uh, a number of offices, Philadelphia being the main office and the main problem where uh, the wiring was done uh, split pair, uh, so there was a 100 meg max, so which uh, didn't lead to a great experience in terms of video, so there was a deficiency there. Uh, the thin clients uh, were not iGel at the time, it was uh, end computing, which um, were known to work well with Citrix, but our experience uh, with them was uh, less than optimal, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the user experience right off the bat uh, was not good. Uh, the initial reaction was, well, this is worse than what I had on my aging Windows XP desktop. So uh, there was uh, immediate bad word of mouth, uh, spreading like wildfire, you know, don't let IT take your system away. You know, you'll get my XP system when you pry it from my cold dead hands, that sort of thing. Um, because slow, log slow login times, trouble printing, uh, random disconnections, uh, you name it, uh, it, was a, it was a major problem. And the VDI rollout uh, stalled uh, pretty significantly in uh, 2014. So how did we fix the mess? Uh, we the first thing we did to start getting things going back in the right direction was implementing uh, nimble storage in uh, 2015. Uh, when I first met John Anthony, uh, we were at a legal security conference down in Baltimore in uh, June of 2015, and uh, you know we went to talk to him about security. Ended up talking about storage because we said, hey, we're doing VDI and it's awful and you know, first thing he said was, you, know, you need to put in a nimble. Uh, so yeah, actually, when you were describing your symptoms, um, and, and almost immediately, I think I said, I think you have a storage problem, as I recall. And sure enough, uh, it, it panned out that you did, in fact, have a storage problem, and nimble ultimately solved our problem. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so the putting in the nimble, uh, actually was uh, instrumental in helping me, uh, you know, get to the director position. Uh, because at the time uh, that uh, my director left, things were not well. Uh, you know, we had historically enjoyed a good, a good reputation within the firm uh, as an IT department, and that had started to uh, degrade. And, you know, the feeling was, hey, we need to, everything's a mess, we need to bring in an expert to, you know, clean everything up. And with putting in the Nimble, um, right to about a month before I had an interview for the position, things started to improve. And I was able to make the argument that, yes, things were a problem in the past, um, but uh, we've identified what the uh, problems are and things are getting better, uh, which they were. And we can t can continue uh, to make things better. Uh, so I'm thankful that uh, I had uh, John's help to get that nimble in there, and thankful that the management at the firm uh, gave me a chance to continue uh, fixing the issues with VDI, and, uh, and I'm still here today. Um, 
uh, some of the other things uh, we did were upgrade the uh, the Citrix version. We were on we were running an older version, and and Converse and helped us uh, get up to speed uh, with a newer Citrix version. And uh, we also changed our design. Uh, our the previous design, which was done by another integrator, uh, didn't make sense given our size and our infrastructure. So we uh, we moved from uh, provisioning to machine creation services, which uh, took advantage of the faster storage that we had available and uh, things uh, did get a lot better. Uh, it allowed you, and that, and that change obviously allowed you to be more a agile whilst uh, reducing complexity, right? Um, yes. So that, that was a very good change. Yeah, it, uh, it uh, reduced, you know, we were having issues with the provisioning servers and, uh, you know, switching to machine creation took away a, a major bottleneck uh, that we had there. So while things improved uh, dramatically from 2014 to late 2015, early 2016, uh, there were still some complications and some people we couldn't win over uh, to VDI. And um, that mainly focused on the thin clients. Uh, most of our attorneys, excuse me, and some of our paralegals uh, use dual monitor, and the, the one thing with the device we had was that it only supported one monitor uh, within the device. There was an option for a USB dongle, uh, but they were pretty much useless. The the second monitor running on that dongle operated at about half speed and uh, was pretty useless uh, for uh, legal work, uh, for reviewing, uh, reviewing documents. Um, it just uh, it just didn't work well. So, you know, I sort of had an epiphany uh, late at night uh, and, you know, we're, things were getting better and uh, I was just kind of thinking, like, you know, how can we really get this going? Because it, it didn't, we had a mixed environment, which really didn't make much sense. You know, we had invested all this time and money into VDI and uh, it, it was better, but it still wasn't there. And we still had over 100 physical desktops, uh, most of which were converted Windows XP machines running Windows 7, which were now eight years old, uh, not ideal at all from a design and performance perspective. So uh, it just kind of struck me late at night after another round of trying to patch the end computing boxes with another round of firmware thinking maybe this will solve the problem, and it didn't. I just kind of decided, hey, you know, we need to we need to switch out these thin clients. You know, we're we're fighting a losing battle here, and it's just it's not going to improve. So uh, I had made the decision to uh, replace the thin clients, and um, my initial thoughts were, well, let's look at HP and Dell. And uh, John Anthony had mentioned IGL to me. I, I wasn't familiar with the name at the time and I kind of shot him down saying well you know I, I can't afford to screw this up you know I, I have to get this right so let me just focus on the major players uh, you know, Dell and HP and uh, I subsequently heard from a few other uh, vendors that you know to check out iGel and uh, you know the the pilot with Dell and HP w was very underwhelming and I Finally relented and told John Anthony, "Hey, you know, let me check out an iGel device." Uh, well, and you, so if you don't mind, I just want to highlight real quick. I mean, this is precisely why we partner with iGel and we lead with iGel is because the user experience is so much better uh, with with their devices than with the you know the the traditional approaches like HP Dell Wise. Mm -hmm. So the the reaction was positive uh, from our internal IT, uh, uh, first of all, from our, our hardware technician who I tasked with getting this, uh, the devices set up. He said it was such a breeze to set it up compared to Dell and HP, and it looked much cleaner, much neater. Uh, so we, we started with a pilot of about uh, 30 devices uh, last late last summer, uh, August, September 2016. So normally, when you when you roll out something in IT, it's usually oh you know what's the big deal or this is worse uh, you know it, it's not the way it's not what I'm used to um, it's very you know and you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. Some people complain about any everything and uh, it's very rare when you roll something out that people actually go out of their way to tell you something positive. 
and not complain about it. And that was something that we immediately saw uh, with IGEL was immediate positive uh, reaction and good word of mouth. Uh, I think of an associate who was in the office right next to me in Philadelphia who uh, worked out of our suburban New Jersey office uh, occasionally and uh, he had had a end computing uh, device in, a, in the Philadelphia office and had used an iGel in a visiting office in Cherry Hill and he actually emailed me from Cherry Hill saying, hey, I'm on this device here and it's it's excellent. Can I get one from my Philadelphia office? So didn't even know what it was. He just knew that it was better. Uh, and so we took care of him in Philadelphia, uh, immediate positive word of mouth, which spread to other attorneys in Philadelphia, and I started to get some clamoring for the new device. Uh, you know, I gave one to my boss, uh, the, the firm's managing partner, who was uh, – not positive on a lot of things, but he was positive on the device. So we quickly uh, burned through those 30 devices, got them all rolled out, got a lot of positive feedback, uh, especially for users who had had issues running a um, running a second monitor. And uh, it became abundantly clear that uh, iGel had solved the last major issue we had uh, with the VDI rollout, which was having a strong uh, consistent, solid, uh, thin client to uh, support the VDI uh, sessions. So we were able to finally uh, get people moved off of not only end computing, but those old converted uh, Windows XP uh, desktops. So I will now uh, pass it back to uh, Sagnik. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, that's a very fascinating story. Um, You've talked about your infrastructure, your VDI rollout, and how you face issues and identified a few of those and trying to get the most out of virtualization, uh, changing the design altogether, investing your time and the money and, and company. I mean, I thought that's a very fascinating story. And I would like to drill down into some more details of your implementation and uh, what specific issues you faced and see if you can uh, if we can pull out some learnings from your experience. Um, an audience, uh, if you have any questions, uh, drop in those in the question panel in the next uh, coming section. So, um, so question to you, Brad. Now, so you mentioned that uh, you have about, I think, 275 end users and uh, you have been able to virtualize about 240 of these users. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the issues that you faced? Uh, what stopped you virtualizing everyone and what progress uh, you have made over the years since your initial implementation, I believe that was 2013? Yeah, so the initial, uh, you know, we, we had set out, of course, to get everyone that we could onto VDI. And the initial roadblock was that it just wasn't working well. Uh, so uh, people had asked for their old XP boxes back, or, or we kind of did it out of desperation because they're, they couldn't get their work done. Um, so, you know, once we were able to get through, uh, and the, the dual monitor was another major impediment, too, where uh, people needed a second monitor for intensive document reviews. We could just, we never could get the second monitor working well enough um, to support those people. And, you know, some people kept the second monitor on the thin client and just kind of struggled through it or only put their email on the second monitor and, and not uh, any internet windows or, or document review programs and others uh, we had to give physical desktops to. So once we fixed all the issues with VDI and, and eventually went, you know, with iGel with devices that could support the second monitor natively. Uh, we then went back and tried to convert back all the people who had said no to VDI because of the earlier issues with the thin client and the second monitor. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty much done with that process. But now the, the, the last impediment is people that use specialized applications that um, we either can't put on the image or don't run well on the image. Uh, and I'm, we're small enough so that I'm handling that on a on a case-by-case -case basis at this point. Uh, obviously, we want to eliminate as many desktops as we can because it's so much easier from a, um, an IT maintenance perspective, which was part of the initial reason for 
uh, going to VDI. And you know what happened was during the bad days, it it became more of a hassle uh, to update the image uh, because it, everything was spread out all over the place. And and now it's much easier to update the image when there's a software patch for one of our many applications, uh, Windows security updates. It's much easier to, to handle it through VDI. Uh, and I'm, you know, we're working on trying to whittle down that list of physical machines that are left because, um, you know, it, it's a major administrative headache having to log into each individually and 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 do the patches and you know clear it with the end user, uh, many of whom are fond of staying logged in for weeks at a time and having a bunch of documents open, you know, clearing it with them and saying, you know, we're going to have to reboot your session. So, um, you know, we we worked out the all the good all the good reasons people not being able to get their work done, and now we're uh, we're just kind of left with uh, specialized applications um, that require a, uh, a physical machine. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also right, add with 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 Citrix uh, recent acquisition of of Unidesk, and now the product of course is called App Layering. I mean, we we may be able to get more of those specialized apps into the image over time. Um, the other other point I'd like to accent with this question is just um, around around the choice for iGel and the amount of hardware um, and, and the ease at which we can get hardware peripherals to work with iGel. Uh, we, we have seen in the practice of law that we have had the greatest success with iGel and Citrix than any other platform uh, like the foot pedals, the dictation devices, We've had great, great success of getting those to work uh, with the iGel thin clients. We have not had similar success with HP and Dell Wise uh, in in the practice of law. Now, we are, obviously there's a great install base of those, but um, there are just a great number of peripherals that simply won't work. So that that's just yet another reason why we've had such great success here at at Schneider. Yeah, and, and this is Simon here from IGEL. A couple of points. You know, our, our goal is not to replace. We we often find you can't put every endpoint onto VDI. There's often something other tricky that will stop you doing that, and and that's one of the reasons why IGEL supports. You know, primarily the IGEL OS, which is which is a Linux derivative, but we also have an agent that runs on a Windows box. So that for Brian, he can be managing some Windows boxes alongside of the uh, the iGel OS uh, thin clients, making it easier for him to see the big picture of all the devices. And, and we see this across the board with our customers that, that, that some printers, some scanners, some specialty devices. You know, we've got 75 engineers in Augsburg, but they can't fix every problem immediately. You know, we're working on it, but uh, it's it's a process. And, and one of the things I love about this story is, you know, the, the the process that Brian's been through in bringing up to speed all of his users and, and slowly adding more and, and more tricky use cases. I think it's a classic example of how VDI should be done. Sorry, back back to you, Sagnik. We're getting distracted here. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I think that's a great conversation to have, and uh, really uh, understanding Brian's process, uh, you can find out the real value of the VDI overall solution. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the UMS is also uh, that you mentioned is a great management tool for all the endpoints uh, from my gel managing and just a gel and also other devices. Um, and coming back to Brian, uh, so this you mentioned about productivity. So how do you measure uh, how did you measure productivity for the lawyers and your IT staff? Like, uh, what metrics were you measuring? So, you know, in terms of uh, billable hours, which is, of course, the, the lifeblood of any law firm, so it, it's hard to translate that into hard data. I mean, as as a firm, uh, we're we're doing better now than we were a few years ago, but I mean that. Depend on a lot of a lot of factors outside of IT, just you know, with uh, more billable work. But um, so there's there's some factors that you can't measure. I mean, certainly uh, there's less angry calls about uh, not being able to log in or, or or getting disconnected, which you know translates into lost time, either billable time or personal time for our attorneys and staff. But you know, one metric that we do have that we can measure is uh, calls to our help desk, which uh, are down about 40% uh, now uh, compared to um, 
you know the initial issues that we had uh, with VDI and the uh, and the thin clients. Um, you know we noticed the drop. Uh, you know first with the storage and you know the various design changes, and then also a large drop after we uh, implemented iGel in place of end computing because a lot of those I uh, can't log in or my my screen is black, my device isn't working. I mean those would all go right to our help desk. So. Um, you know, we noticed a, uh, I'd say about, you know, a 20% drop initially uh, with with the redesign, and another 20% drop with the um, the uh, thin client replacement. I say this jokingly, but uh, seriously, one of the, one of the most important metrics in a law firm is whether or not your lawyers want your blood or not. Is that <laughs> is that fair to say, Brian? Yeah, yeah. My uh, se several uh, directors ago, a guy I worked for said, uh, you know, if, if there's no one at the door looking for my uh, looking for my head, you know, it's a it's a good day. So uh, right. <laughs> and 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 my you know and my boss uh, measures my performance with well, there's no one calling him to complain. Uh, so you know, he sees me as a as a success, you know, in that regard because. I'm sure he has no shortage of people calling him to complain about other things that aren't IT related. So people aren't it's calling him to complain a, about IT. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a rare, it's rare for an IT guy to get an attaboy in a law firm. Fair. Right. Very fair. <laughs> I hope my manager is not watching this webinar, or knowing the metrics of number of complaints goes to him about me. So yeah, that's a pretty good metric to measure, I guess. Uh, so Brian, coming to performance issues, um, was there any noticeable difference between San Francisco office and uh, Philadelphia office, which is where your data center is located? Yeah, that is uh, that's a good question because you know San Francisco has always been uh, a problem area uh, just because of uh, the distance involved, where. Um, you know we're primarily based on the East Coast. Uh, and Pittsburgh isn't exactly isn't exactly on the coast, but it's uh, it's eastern. Uh, San Francisco is the only office that we have that's not geographically within a couple hundred miles of Philadelphia. Um, so um, very uh, very dependent on uh, uh, having a, a strong uh, WAN. Uh, you know, to reach back into the data center and very um, whenever there are issues they'd be the first to notice them uh, and again it's a major part of the success story was getting IGEL devices out there and uh, increasing the user happiness and productivity uh, in that office um, you know since we've implemented IGEL and uh, I'll, I'll go back to the second monitor thing um, that was one office where we just couldn't get the second monitors to work at all, and I think it was because of the latency that uh, the users were experiencing having to go through a USB dongle for the second monitor was just uh, exacerbated by the long distance uh, over the over the country. So I, I never could get the second monitors working successfully over there with the end computing and uh, with the iGels, they're working fine. Isn't isn't also important, right. important to mention? I, I think we are using SD WAN as well to ensure connectivity. Is that right, Brian? Correct. Uh, and uh, though they aren't on this call, uh, what I was able to do was uh, put in uh, a cogent line out there uh, using Tolari for SD WAN, which also made a big difference. Uh, we were able to. Um, utilize the same carrier we have uh, our primary internet carrier in our Philadelphia data center we're able to utilize them out in San Francisco uh, with just an internet link and uh, an SD WAN box um, so we're able to improve our bandwidth and also uh, lower our communication costs we're on a, a dual MPLS network uh, out there but only able to utilize one line at a time and uh, we were able to reduce our latency and increase our uh, our uptime uh, through uh, implementation of uh, of SD WAN out there. Right, very interesting. And uh, yeah, Agile thin clients are uh, SD WAN compatible and Zen desktop uh, SDX premium level, so it goes under 
before before call, like calling out that it's co compatible with the product version it undergoes a vast verification process uh, and performed by both our teams at IGL and Citrix ready so I'm glad that uh, you're finding the value uh, in our joint solution um, so Brian are uh, talking moving security um, have you been affected by any of the recent uh, spate of malware, uh, Pitya and uh, WannaCry, and uh, how do you protect yourself from these issues? Um, we uh, we have not recently. Um, we did have an issue uh, uh, several years ago um, with uh, ransomware that we had to go back to. Um, uh, snapshots on the storage system and, and backup tapes in one instance. Uh, thankfully, we weren't hit as hard as we could have been. Uh, and we've since uh, tightened up our controls uh, for uh, running macros within Office and then also uh, implemented some security features uh, from Mimecast uh, for email filtering, uh, both for sandboxing attachments and also uh, screening out uh, uh, malicious URLs. So. Um, you know, having VDI is an advantage there in that uh, you know we we're able to wipe anything clean, um, anything bad that gets in. We're we're first focused on keeping the bad stuff out, and then also if something were to get in, someone's uh, sort of throwing off alerts on our desktop. We're able to just log that user out and uh, destroy that machine automatically. Uh, so you know, having uh, having VDI and and having more people on BDI is certainly part of our uh, overall security strategy. Excellent. And uh, tell us more about your endpoint. Uh, so, we uh, what about the peripheral devices? Uh, there were mentioned of dictation devices and uh, so forth. And do you ever have issues with headsets, scanners, printers? Any other specialty devices that end user uh, want you to support? Uh, yeah, as John Anthony mentioned, uh, you know, dictation was the major issue. Um, we have a number of those legacy devices around, and I've been working on eliminating that. I mean, the like anything else, there, there's an app for it, uh, so it's hard for me to justify, uh, you know, replacing a. 12-year-old dictation device with another dictation device that costs three or four hundred bucks when you know you could just use an app for ten dollars and take care of it but you know the, the problem there is that uh, you know a lot of the attorneys that use dictation are uh, not as technically proficient so getting them to, to maneuver around an app uh, can be difficult and then uh, even if I can get them to use the app the app the secretary is still need to use a, a, a foot pedal to um, you know, to play back a dictation. So uh, there was a need for the thin client to support the uh, you know the the old uh, dictation equipment that we have, which which still works. And again, you know, in competing for budget dollars, we you know we don't want to spend money unnecessarily. So it, it doesn't make sense to upgrade a uh, a foot pedal that still works fine. Uh, so that was one of the main tests that we put the dictation equipment through was uh, supporting um, supporting the dictation equipment uh, that, that having the having a thin client that would support the dictation equipment which with end computing it was back and forth uh, it seemed to be uh, you know, towards the end we had a, a, a mix match of firmware because patching the firmware would fix some issues but then it would usually break dictation so we had, had to have the secretaries at one level of firmware and the people with the dual monitors so uh, at another one not didn't fix the dual monitors but I mean there were some versions of firmware were better than others for uh, in terms of the, the latency issue so um, no issues at all with peripherals uh, you know, second monitor being the biggest one uh, uh, dictation equipment printers uh, it all handles it uh, very smoothly yeah, and as I as I recall back, um, that was a value that we also played into this process. As we wrote uh, for Brian the scripts, you know, the process, not the scripts, the process to get all of that legacy equipment to um, function uh, with the iGel and also their VDI environment with Citrix. So, um, as I recall, we we actually built all that out for you and shipped it to you, if my memory is correct. Yes, yes, you did. 
Uh, that actually uh, brings us around to a couple of questions that are coming through on the on the question and answer. We might be a, appropriate to interrupt just for a second on this one. Um, somebody asked uh, a question about which dictation recorder and pedals are you using. I don't know if you know the brands that you're actually using, Brian. Yes, for it, those. Yes, it's uh, it's Philips. It's uh, yeah, okay. Philips uh, again uh, of a. 2004-ish uh, vintage, I think 9350, 9400 for the uh, for the uh, let me say dictators, the uh, the, the handheld uh, recorders, and then uh, I'm not sure of the the model on the foot pedal. I, I doubt that changes all that much, but it's it's also uh, Phillips. Yeah, and I can just add that we have had a lot of success with, with the Legacy Phillips equipment at other firms, um, not just Schneider, and also Olympus as well, for, for those that are listening. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other question that we got, same, similar vein, is are you using Skype for business or Jabber for uh, uh, universal communications? And, and then whilst I'm at it, I'm going to ask, which, can you tell us which versions of the iGel thin clients you're using? Um, I, I, there's uh, one question was, are you using the UD Pocket? So maybe you can uh, tell us quickly which versions of iGel you're using as well as the uh, um, Skype for Business or for Universal Communications. So for the devices, I, I had thought about um, using the desktop converter and using, uh, you know, the old those old XP boxes. And, and while I was able to convert a device successfully, uh, I was just worried about the optics of, you know, hey, this is a brand new system, but, you know, we're, you're running on your same old uh, uh, XP box. And, you know, and thankfully, I was able to get the budget to get the, the UD3 uh, devices with the, the native support for dual monitor and, uh, you know, and the graphics processing. So I, I think that was, it was key to just get it right. You know, we looked at UD Pocket and, and, and converting, uh, you know, utilizing some old hardware, and and you know, that that may be a solution for some organizations. Uh, you know, for us, uh, it was just better to just go with the the actual uh, iGel hardware, uh, which is uh, you know a great reason for for going to iGel is just having the the superior hardware. And uh, I think we're at version 5.11 of um, the uh, of the uh, iGel software. On, the, on our endpoints. Excellent. Well, we get, we're getting you migrated to the version 10, which is our 64-bit version that's, uh, got, that we've been working a lot on all the peripherals on that one at the moment. So hopefully we'll see that coming through. Um, on the universal communication side, Skype for Business, Jabber, any of you know the Cisco VXME solutions, are you using either of those? No, we're, uh, we're on Shortel for... Um, uh, for our phones, which is is legacy, there, there's a short tail communicator app that we use, but um, it works fine with VDI. But uh, uh, you know, if we're talking about going to a phone-free uh, or physical phone-free environment, uh, we're we're not there yet, and I I don't think I'd be able to explain to a an attorney of a certain age why he shouldn't have a phone in his office; he should just use his computer. So we're that. We're not that type of organization, um, but uh, for other organizations that that may work. So I, I can't uh, I can't uh, comment on that. Um, you know, we don't use Skype uh, with the thin client. Uh, we have a, a handful of users who uh, who do use it for for certain calls, and they are on physical desktop. And uh, you know, it just hasn't gone to the level of uh, usage within the firm that. You know, it made it made sense to invest a lot of hours and 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 uh, you know and and trying it out and getting it to work. It's just easier. We have we have some uh, uh, all-in-one desktops uh, that you know work well for that purpose, having the integrated camera. So we we decided to go with our existing hardware, and it's just a, it's just a handful of people anyway. Um, if, if it was if we're talking ten or twenty at that point, then uh, you know, we would probably work with. Uh, with iGel and, and conversant on, uh, on on getting that uh, getting that to work, but it's just not not much of a priority at this point for us. Thanks. Um, so, and in, in further answer to that, and, and I'll take this offline, but uh, it's interesting to note that iGel and Citrix Ready are, are actually writing a deployment guide on the use of Citrix for on, on Skype for Business with iGel with Citrix with Sennheiser. 
one of the headset manufacturers. So, so um, Jeff, you asked about that question. I'll, I'll make sure you get a copy of that deployment guide when it becomes available. And uh, thanks for your questions. Sorry, back back to you, Sagnik. I, I interrupted a little bit. No, those are good questions. Um, so I'll just uh, get to the last question. Uh, we were just almost getting over the A. So the end user feedback, um, Brian, so can you give us any anecdotes about how the implementation has been received and feedback from your end users? Um, you know, we, we've been running uh, all IGEL uh, for uh, almost a year now. I, I think San Francisco was the last office we did, which was earlier this year in, in February. Uh, pretty much every other office was completed in uh, November of last year. Um, so again, I uh, as the devices were switched out, uh, there were no complaints. Uh, there was no one that told me it was worse than before, and you know, not not everyone is going to call me and and give me a glowing review. But uh, the amount of people that did, and and the type of people that did, you know, people not given to positive reactions for most things IT related, uh, for, for them to actually uh, uh, compliment me on it and 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 saying you know that it was a big improvement. Uh, was uh, you know it, it was a good investment of money. You know it's never easy to uh, say, hey, we wasted money on this. Uh, you know, which is which is what we did, unfortunately, with the pre previous um, then clients. And you know, one thing I've learned um, in this position over the last uh, two years is that sometimes cheap is expensive. Uh, you know, you, you may be able to get a a cheaper than client than IGEL. I'm sure you can get a cheaper than client than IGEL, but um, what are you getting for the money? And you know, if that device uh, doesn't work, doesn't meet the expectations of your users, um, you're going to waste that money because uh, now you're going to have to go out and get a better than client, and um, and that money will be will be wasted. So um, it uh, you know was a little bit of a tough sell uh, you know to investing the money, but again. Uh, be able to say we got it right, and you know we're not going to have to worry about uh, replacing these devices for uh, a long time. Um, you know, as we look towards uh, upgrading our our desktop to Windows 10 and Office 2016 uh, within the next year or so, to already say we have the hardware in place on the desktop to do it uh, is a you know is a big win there. Great. Um, uh, all right. I think these were the questions that I had uh, from the moderators. I'll, the rest of the things which Simon has passed on, which are more generic from the audience that we been asked, so I'll, I'll ask one by one. Um, so Bran and uh, Clark, so John, you can take it up as it's relevant. So did you consider other virtualization technologies, like what you settled on Citrix? Was that question intended for me? Uh, yeah, Brian, um, Brian, you can take okay. it or John. So 2013, so did you consider any other virtualization technologies or like what made you settle on Citrix? Um, I mean, we'd, we've been a Citrix shop for uh, uh, since probably I think 2004, 2005, uh, when the firm uh, first introduced uh, remote desktop capability, uh, so it uh, it made sense to uh, to stick with it. You know, given the existing licensing and the existing um, relationship that we had uh, with uh, with Citrix, uh, and then also having um, having Conversant around as a uh, a trusted Citrix partner and reseller who you know could evaluate our environment and say you know the the problem isn't you know with Citrix Citrix itself it was with your design and storage and then also helping us uh, you know get uh, software upgrades in place successfully so uh, you know having a long-standing relationship with Citrix uh, helped um, you know we're also a Citrix uh, Netscaler uh, customer, uh, and that falls in line with the uh, you know Citrix BDI as well. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would just add, add a little, Brian, little more color to that as well in that uh, I, I would be as bold as to say that if you're going to do VDI, you should do it with no one else but Citrix, um, in particular in a law firm, um, because the user experience is so keenly important in a law firm uh, due to the nature of the users and how they work and when they work and from where they work. Citrix supports the largest number of use cases and user experiences to facilitate a proper environment uh, to, to support law users. Um, so that, that is why we lead with Citrix in, 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 in law. And we have a vast experience in implementing VDI um, in the practice of law. And oftentimes we'll go in behind a uh, a, a VMware view or horizon deployment and we're asked to assess those environments and I, I can tell you all, n- nine times out of ten we will recommend to the firm to remove those um, remove that and replace it with Citrix just simply because there's no way to deliver upon the um, the user experiences that law users require otherwise yeah, and I can I can validate Excellent. that too from from the IGEL perspective that we 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 see a lot of our enterprise customers who have particularly who have users with complex implementations require the strength of the Citrix solution. It is more comprehensive in terms of the number of applications, the number of devices it can support, and the and the, you know the full set of capabilities. And, and, and we see that in our customer base, that the more complex implementations where you've got fussy prima donna users like lawyers uh, require a Citrix solution. So that w- we too would, would back up uh, uh, John and Conversant on recommending Citrix in this particular situation. Um, I did get a couple of questions coming through from the audience, I think, so forgive me for interrupting, but um, Brian, which version of Windows are you using today, and what version of Office are you using, and what version of Citrix are you on at the moment? Maybe you can just give us a quick update on, on where you are with that. I think you mentioned it before, but just to reiterate, thank you. So we're, so we're Windows 7, um, Office 2010. And then we're at, uh, I believe, 7.8 on uh, Zen Desktop, which I know is, uh, I think, 7.13 or 14 is the current version. So 7, we had 15, been at 7. actually. 15, okay. So we were at 7.0 for a long time, uh, which wasn't uh, uh, the best version to be running at. And uh, Converse and it got us up to 7.8, which has been uh, stable for us and working well. And I'm sure we'll, we'll look to get... Uh, Upgraded to something newer uh, within the next uh, year or so as well. I think I think you're a classic customer of if, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. You get <laughs> yes. to something stable that's working. <laughs> the tendency is compared to, to, compared to where we were and before. Yeah, going. yeah. Let's let's not break it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's not a bad recipe for success. Unfortunately, of course, you have Windows 10 coming down the pike fairly hard, and you know the end of Windows 7 has been announced and. Uh, uh, there's a lot more new functionality coming out in the new versions of Office, so I'm sure that's going to be uh, high on your list of priorities for the future. So, uh, looking forward to working with Converse and, and Citrix to help you do those upgrades over the course of the coming years. Yes. Sagnik, back to you. Great. Um, I have another question. This is for John. Uh, how did you do your initial assessment on of the performance issues that Schneider was experiencing? Actually, it's it's a very interesting story. I mean, uh, as as Brian had mentioned, um, we were both attending LegalSec, uh, which is a NILTA event, and I believe that that year it was in Baltimore, and. Uh, Brian had uh, stopped by our booth, and we were talking security, and when, one thing led to another, and we started talking about their VDI deployment. Um, I, I, my background is in Citrix. I have been a Citrix consultant uh, from the, since the mid-'90s, so I have a great deal of personal experience with the products, um, and also I've been working with law firms since 1998, so uh, my background is extensive, and so... Uh, when he was explaining the, the problems, my a, immediate reaction was simply, I believe that you have a storage problem. Uh, Brian and I, if my memory is correct, we did a few remote sessions where uh, I personally reviewed uh, their Citrix installation. I reviewed NetScaler, um, and also we, we, we talked extensively about a, a POC with Nimble. And so their, 
their installation of Nimble st started out as a POC. And I, I recall at one point the prior director even wanting to end the POC before we had had enough time to actually get uh, the new VDI desktops moved over to the storage platform. I don't remember what the driver for that was, but I, I remember that uh, Brian in his stroke of genius uh, was able to convince the prior director, no, no, this doesn't make sense. I was, I was completely distraught as my memory is memories go um, as a, because I knew beyond a doubt that uh, storage was their core problem and uh, in fact it did it did play out that way is that fair Brian yeah that, that was true and I mean the the issue you know we got the box in and then the thought at the time was well uh, you know our disaster recovery was based on uh, NetApp to NetApp replication and we we're, were kind of like well this isn't a NetApp so it's not going to work for DR and then I I think there was just a miscommunication between, uh, you know, the old the old director and the other network engineer, and you know, I kind of said, hey, we're not going to be running VDI in DR anyway. We're, you know, we're just going to be running into the data center, and we'll handle, you know, backup desktops another way. And then it was just kind of like, oh yeah, that's that's right. And <laughs> so thankfully, uh, we were able to. Uh, I remember getting a panic phone call from John, which completely took me by surprise. Uh, you know, what do you mean we're getting rid of this? Because you know we haven't even tried it yet. Uh, and I think you also mentioned that no one had ever returned to Nimble. <laughs> so we, we yeah, that's that exactly right. The first. <laughs> yeah, the only other thing I would add on the assessment question is, in, in this particular case, we did not do a full comprehensive uh, Citrix assessment. Um, though we and our team are very capable of that, uh, I would say that. Uh, as assessments go, we probably can uh, produce. Well, actually, I know beyond a doubt we can produce the the a, a very good report and a very comprehensive one, probably better than anyone else in in the market. So, but we did not do that for Schneider in this particular case. We've just had a long, now a, a, a good standing relationship, and we communicate a lot. So we, that's how it's developed. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, thanks. This is great conversations. Uh, Brian and uh, John and Simon, thanks a lot for participating in this round two discussion. Um, we have a shortage of time, so we will proceed to wrap up. Um, Brian, if you can move on to the next slide. Uh, so or I think, I guess we don't, um, these discussions were very engaging and I can already see a lot of thanks showering on the chat box for sharing uh, these stories with our audience. Um, I think we successfully managed to have pick their brains as they plan to drive their digital transformation initiatives at their firms. Uh, uh, so um, is there anything from call to action perspective that uh, Conversion Group or IGL want to bring up here? Um, you, you have 30 seconds to go. I'll let you go, let you go first. I think. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. Um, I, frankly, no. This is this is. I, I love listening to this story, and I've heard it a couple of times already. But um, I really appreciate Brian's storytelling and uh, the implementation, and uh, it, it's a very interesting use case. So uh, nothing more to add than you know, there's there's a there's an example of the case study that we did with Schneider on our website. Please feel to come and pick. Uh, pick a copy of that, and um, John, I'll pass it over to you for your final comment. Yeah, the, what I what I would say is that if you're going to do VDI, do it right. And um, Citrix, iGel, they they are absolutely great technologies. They are the best, in fact. But if your implementation is bad, your users are going to hate you. So you, you need to do it right the first time. That's what I would encourage you to do. And we can help you do that at Conversant. This is obviously what we do. We have now many decades of experience in total uh, at doing this and doing it right. And so it, it, it's important to remember that when you do implement VDI, there are many considerations beyond just just Citrix and Netscaler, right? And and the endpoint, you you have to consider storage, your hosts. I mean, all of those things need to be discussed, evaluated, and assessed uh, before you start designing and implementing. Perfect. And uh, Simon, I'll let you speak the one last thing. Um, move on to the next slide, Simon. Next slide, please. Whilst we're at it, you may have heard that iGel has been giving away a Tesla. 
Uh, we actually gave away a Tesla back in August, a Tesla uh, uh, P100D. We, we, we were so successful with that. We got such a lot of interest and it generated such a lot of interest on that. Um, uh, we could decided to continue and we're actually going to be giving away a, a 2018 Tesla Model 3 in January. If you're interested and you, and you don't have to be, the draw, the draw will actually take place in Germany, but you don't have to be present to win. So if you do have time and you are interested in winning a Tesla, just go to igeltesla.com, type in the access code TEC06 and fill in a couple of questions and complete a short demonstration and you will be entered in our Tesla draw. And we'd be delighted to hope that one of you wins. Um, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. It's been a great session. And uh, thank you, Citrix Ready, for helping us host this and for a conversant, and in particular, Brian at Schneider for taking the time to describe your story. I've really appreciated this. And this was Simon from uh, IGEL saying thanks. Bye, everybody. Oh, next Bye, slide. And this shall conclude up. Alrighty.